Well, thank you, Colin, and thank you for those nice words. I, um, you know, the the conversation that, or the the short talk that I'm about to give, really um, grew out of a conversation that I had with Colin uh, a week or two ago, and just we were kind of just brainstorming on the nature of the value of Filecoin, and um, you know, as a you know, the first thing I should say is that. I am not an economist and I am not a securities analyst. I'm a venture capitalist. And so my perspective on the value of Filecoin is not informed by any particular experience with, um, with valuing assets. Um, it's interesting that my partner at Placeholder, Chris Bernitsky, has spent a lot of time valuing assets and has actually written a book about valuing uh, crypto assets and a series of blog posts. And um, what I've found in, in, in talking pretty much daily with Chris about the value of crypto assets broadly is that um, it really feels to me as if we're using um, a framework that was developed for a different set of assets, usually um, some kind of equity or commodity. And we're trying to sort of shoehorn um, a phenomenon that is, you know, much uh, more complex in many ways than the existing uh, assets that are being valued with these frameworks. So, um, most of uh, what I've seen, at least, is that you know people are trying to understand crypto assets as either a capital asset, um, which is like a uh, an equity or a bond or real estate. And it's, it's defined as something that will produce a stream of income and they try to value uh, the asset based on a discounted cash flow of that future stream of income. Um, it became clear, I think, to everybody pretty quickly that that was insufficient. It didn't really make sense. Um, and so people, including Chris, began to think of them as um, somewhere between a capital asset and a what's called a consumable transformable asset. And so that's um, more like a commodity, something like oil or wheat or gas. Um, and you know, that that, you know, those commodities are are again valued using different techniques um, than um, that that I'm I'm gonna argue again don't completely make sense. And finally, you know, the other mechanism that um, you know, the other category, the other large mega category that people try and shove assets into are stores of value. And that would be something like gold or art or fiat currency. And so, you know, I, you know, I have never worked as a securities analyst. I've never actually worked, I'm not much of a mathematician. And so I've never really worked with any of uh, the models that people produce but when you step back and think about it, these models have existed really since about 1934, um, and equities themselves have existed since the late uh, 16, 1600s. So it took a long time to begin to, you know, build these models, and you know, and and they've been refined over the years, and they really work pretty well for the assets that exist today. Um, my 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 thinking and the and the conversation that I had with Colin is that something about uh, Filecoin and about crypto assets generally is quite different, um, and I think that um, one way that I've been thinking about it is that you know most equities, as an example, are valued um, based on this future stream of income, which means that you look at an income statement um, and you try and figure out what what the asset will produce and you try and figure out what the value of that stream of income will be. Um, I think that that these crypto assets actually feel a little bit more like they belong on a balance sheet and that they, they represent in some way the total value of a network. And the value of the network is, um, is not easily defined by income. Um, and you know, there certainly are going to be crypto assets that don't have an obvious stream of income. So, um, you know, part of the way I've you know sort of been thinking about it is that um, as as we as as we think about the way we manage our own uh, financial uh, 
our own budget, our own financial um, lives, um, we usually organize it into like a checking account where you, you, know, you actually have day-to-day -day transactions and you move money in and out uh, very quickly. A savings account where you have uh, a longer term you know, assets that you hope will earn a little bit of, uh, of a return. And then perhaps you own some, some equities that um, are going to be a, a longer, an even longer term hold and that will you know, perhaps be more volatile, hopefully will appreciate more in the long run. And as I think about it, as I think about something like Filecoin, it actually doesn't really fit into any of those. Um, it's something that you might use every day the way you would use uh, assets in your checking account. Um, it is um, also something that might appreciate um, in the way that an equity would appreciate. And so I, you know, I'm starting to think about these networks um, in a way that is, um, you know, I think causing me at least to rethink the, all of these models of valuation. And so, you know, just as a way of, as kind of a thought exercise to think about where we might be, you know, 10 years in the future, this is kind of a what if, um, what if all of us are participants in 20, 30, 50 networks and, we are participants in those networks because we have confidence in the code, we have confidence in the community, we have confidence that the protocol will do the thing that it's meant to do. We have confidence that the economics, the crypto economics designed into the protocol actually create the proper incentives to encourage people to participate in constructive ways. And we believe in the values of the network. And so we've chosen to align ourselves to participate in a network for all of those reasons. And our participation will lead to an increase in value in that network. And we will participate in that value as, you know, as we uh, continue to interact with the network, continue to uh, transact within the network. And if you imagine that that's true, then maybe we're heading into a world where we don't really separate um, shareholders and consumers, where all of us are both at the same time a shareholder and a consumer. Um, and that we could imagine a world where it's the act of consuming that creates value in the, in the shares that we own as members of these networks. Um, and I just, think that that's a world that feels a lot better than the one that we live in today, where the value of a network is separated from the, the creators and consumers of value. And it's distributed among equity shareholders and the, the management of the network finds themselves working for those shareholders. And oftentimes at the expense of the creators and consumers of value and the community that that value is created in. And so I'm just excited to see this play out. And uh, I guess the thought that I'd, I'd leave you with is that um, I've always believed as an investor that the best investments are the ones that change the structure of markets. That, you know, sure there are investments that you can make that just do, do the same thing better, faster and cheaper, um, but those aren't nearly as interesting and usually near, not nearly as successful as ones that actually fundamentally change the structure of the market. And I think that Filecoin and, and um, many in the, the entire ecosystem of crypto and crypto assets is fundamentally changing the structure of the market. And I think that that makes it particularly difficult to value these assets because you can't use existing models, but I think it's a future that I at least look forward to. So thank you for the opportunity to share that. Awesome, thanks so much, Brad. Uh, it, it's, it's so interesting. I was just reading an article today that Airbnb gave their hosts, you know, equity in the IPO that they just went through, which is kind of similar to along the lines of some of the themes that, that you're describing within the Falcon network. Uh, so it feels like other firms are slowly catching up. So that's interesting. Thank you so much for the talk.